it's always said, am I on mute or is it okay? Okay. It's always said to, to come to the last, to the end of, a, of our presentations together. It's been an intense several weeks, a joyful several weeks in different places, but we have been greatly blessed and coming here and ending here has been the, the cherry on top of the, the ice cream or the pie. Before we begin, let us ask God's presence as we open up this last subject. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have greatly blessed us with your presence. We have enjoyed very much being part of the new birthdays for 11 of us. What great blessing. What joy. And now as we conclude this Thursday afternoon, the last day of our, of and Becky and I to be here, we want to say thank you for the great blessing, for the messages we have received, for the beautiful music these girls and others, families have shared. We'll take that in our heart. We'll treasure that. But Lord, you are pulling your people together. We are to press together, press together, press together. Get ready, get ready, get ready. So here we are. Be with those that are on the road, those that are coming, those that are going, and most of all, Lord, with our families and our children and our loved ones that are still growing spiritually. We love you and we thank you for hearing our prayer. Give us divine wisdom and illumination in Jesus' name. Amen. We mentioned Noah's Day. We have a lot to learn from Noah's Day. The more we study Noah's Day, the, may, the more we know about tomorrow. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah. I want to thank Brother Ron for the presentations, all that information that he's put together. You're going to get to enjoy even more. I'll have to look at him online. As we study Noah's Day, we realize that the human race is very much like it used to be. Less strong, less intelligent, but just as stubborn. Just as much in love with sin as it was. We saw that as in the days of Noah, they, immorality and violence was the, was the theme of the day. Selfishness, violence, everybody took by force what they wanted and what they could. There was even amalgamation of man and beast. And no doubt, some of the evidences, some of the evidences that they point to today as the missing link, half man, half monkey, were probably results of those experiments in those days. There was a, a, a Christian dentist that became an expert in, in radiology and his study and the study of the skull, the teeth, and the the different races and how the mouth and the, the mandible was made up. So he invented a machine, a 3D x-ray. I don't remember his name because I didn't put it on my notes, but it, it reminds me that of, of the missing link, how that works. He developed a 3D x-ray that could take pictures from every direction, and he could put together a skull of a human and by taking all those x-rays, he could get together a 3D image and rotate it and study the mandible because he was a dentist. One day, he decided to go to Paris. And in Paris, as he was going to the museum, he kept seeing all the missing links 
this is the man as he evolved into human. But those were only models. The real bones were underneath. Those were just the models taking the bones. And he talked to the, he asked to see the curator, and the assistant curator said, he's gone. But I owe the Americans a big debt. During the war, the American army saved my life in the Second World War and my family. So I will help you. And so he took all the bones out, the real bones that were used to make that model, and they put them together inside of that box, and he took a 3D image. That was the monkey man. And then the monkey, monkey man. And then the monkey man, man. <laughs> and then the monkey man. And then the, the monkey man, man, man. And all the evolution from ape to human. And each of them were put together and x-rayed. He thanked the assistant curator and he took his x-rays with him and went to the hotel. And as he was studying the x-rays, he made an incredible discovery. Those bones did not come from the same skulls. Some were male bones, some were female bones, some were monkey bones, and some were human bones. Unfortunately, the assistant curator didn't know that. But when the curator of the museum came, he, he was furious because the cat was out of the bag. You see, as long as nobody could see those bones, there was no experts could analyze them. It was possible to tell people these bones make a full skull and that's the way they were discovered. But now when you analyze them and people realize those aren't even from the same body. They're an accumulation of a mixture of bones. All of a sudden you can't hide the truth that this was all made up. Well, he was so furious about having let that out, they sent people to the hotel to break into his hotel room at whatever cost and steal those x-rays back or kill him. And when he realized that was the case, he had to, he didn't sleep that night. He was what? He was always on the phone he was always watching. They were trying to climb into his window. They were trying to break into his door. And he was calling security. And he was able to survive the night, but they were after him. He somehow was able to get out of the hotel, leaving his things there except taking the x-rays with him. And he made it to the airport. And with the Lord's help, he made it to the U.S. with all of his x-rays. They never stole them. God granted him a tremendous gift, the gift of discovering and revealing the lies that are told about the missing links. And he published a book. And he has all the evidence, and he published the evidence. There were no missing links. It's all an invention to convince people that there is no God and that we evolved. In Noah's day, they messed around with the human genome. And today, we are doing the same. In fact, we would be horrified if we could see the results of those experiments. Some of you know Dr. John Youngberg. Have you met him? The Youngbergs used to work in Asia, and it's a well-known well name. It's almost like Kellogg. Everybody knows Kellogg and every, the, Youngberg was a, the Youngberg family was a tribe, not just a person. But Dr. John Youngberg grew up, I mean, worked in Bolivia when I was a child, and he was Uncle John. 
And Aunt Bonnie, his wife, developed suddenly a brain tumor and they had to come to the States and she died. And then Uncle John married Aunt Millie. Both of them taught at Andrews University for many years. And Dr. John Youngberg, Uncle John, has a son called John and has a son called Wesley. Wesley Youngberg is also well known for his lectures. And John Youngberg has been a close friend of mine. We grew up together. My wife were neighbors with the Youngbergs. We used to see them when we'd come up. And in fact, it is John Youngberg who's at fault for me giving a bottle of perfume when I was eight years old to that young girl right there and asking her to marry me. <laughs> because he told me, I'm going to marry her. I said, no, you're not. I'm going to marry her. And so I quickly bought a bottle of perfume and asked her to marry me. <laughs> and therefore, she, she got engaged very, very young. And she kept her promise. But John is still a very, very close friend. I don't see Wesley too often. But John, Dr. John Youngberg, Sr., owns a property in North Carolina. I believe it's North. I don't think it's South, but in the Carolinas. And John Youngberg Jr. goes up quite frequently and just watches over the property. He teaches industrial arts. He taught at Southern Adventist University for many years. And John Jr. told me the following story about one of his workers. One of his workers is an ex-Special Forces military. He doesn't live in a house. He lives up in the mountains and the trees of North Carolina in the Smoky Mountains. As far as John knows, he has some kind of tree house that he lives in. And he told John that he was assigned to work, he was assigned to work in a military hospital on a military reservation out in the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona. And he said he had to quit. He couldn't stand there because there were so many genetic experiments going on between humans and animals, humans and trees. Human, they were just inserting genes into the human genome to see what would happen. Half animal, half human. None of them, of course, have birth certificates. They're just lab rats. But yet, they're half human. And these experiments were so horrible to him. One, one child with four arms, one child half, half animal, half goat, half frog, He said, I quit. I couldn't anymore. I retired from the military and I'm hiding out, living in the, in the forest. And that, that is only one story. It's happening all over the world. If you want to know what the devil's opinion is and you want to hear an opinion of what he would say, just ask the Pope because he'll repeat to you his opinion exactly like Lucifer would tell you. When, when the Pope was asked about gen human engineering and mixing of genes, he said it's a very good thing that we mix animal genes with the human genes. Well, that's what Satan would say because he wants to destroy God's image in man. I told you, or did I not tell you, about the, the lady who was the best friend of the Pope's sister? Did I tell you that? Not yet? Not here. I met, I met um, in, Euro in Europe, I spent some months, and during those times I met some wealthy bankers, very, very influential people, and some that work for the Federal Reserve and the Vatican Bank. 
And one was a lady from Argentina. Her name was Lila. And because we were in Spain and she was living in Spain, I got to meet her. And she called me quite often. We would talk on the phone. And Lila would call me and tell me, today I transferred $2 billion from the U.S. to the banks in Europe. Or I transferred 500 million today, or five billion dollars. Seems like money is easy to move around if you're inside that circle. But you try to send a million dollars as a regular citizen and they'll stop it, freeze it, and say, where did this money come from? And if it's going to an area they don't want it to, you may never see the money again. But if you're in the inside circle, that, that's going the direction they want. You can move any amount of money anytime. So she would just call me and tell me, and I don't know why she did, but one day she said, I have a question. She said, why is the Federal Reserve and the Vatican Bank working to destroy the world's economy? She said, I thought they would work to help the world's economy. But all the decisions they're doing is to destroy the world economy and cause massive suffering. I said, I can answer that. The best way I can do to answer that is make sure you get a book called The Great Controversy. So we made arrangements for a friend, a, a, a joint friend, to give her the book. Did you know that she read it all in one day? She was so fascinated. And she called me and she said, I now understand. I understand what the world leaders, who controls the finances and where they're going. And I'm going to make a lot of different choices from now on in the way that we handle and transfer money. She was dead six months later. But she told me, I'm the, the Pope's sister is my best friend. And I have managed the Pope, the family name of, of the Pope is Bergoglio. And I have managed their family resources in Argentina for 30 years. So I know the whole family for many, many years. That's why they trust me. But I now know and understand what's going on behind the scenes. The Pope's sister made a statement on, a, a, on an Argentinian newspaper. She said, two weeks after my brother became Pope, something happened to him. He is no longer my brother. He is not the man that I grew up with. I don't recognize him. As I analyze that, I compare it with with Revelation 17 and I believe now that we've heard from now that we heard from Brother Gabriel that the seat of Lucifer is in the Vatican that's his human uh, what should I say that's his throne in this earth and I believe Satan will not trust anybody with managing the last affairs of this world except himself. And two weeks after taking office, the Pope is now controlled by another force, another personality, something else that his sister does not recognize. But she goes, that's not my brother. So if you see if you see the Pope act like a nice grandfather that's so loving and everybody loves an old man that's very kind, but on the other hand, he can ruin the world's economy, support homosexuality laws, destroy the family, encourage the vaccine which will reduce the human race, and then one of these days, he won't have any trouble with 
martyring those that keep the seventh day. Because it's not a human that controls, it's Satan himself. Noah's day. Noah wrestled with criticism. The religious, the, the scientific leaders said, it has never rained, it can never rain. The religious leader, leaders said, God would never destroy such a beautiful world that he created. They were all wrong. And they all died. So you can expect science, science worldly leaders to express opinions and religious leaders, popular religious leaders, to express opinions that would go contrary to God's word. In Jesus' day, many leaders believed in Jesus, but they would not confess him because they were scared of the Sanhedrin. And they lost their souls. They never did confess him. They made their decision, and they stuck with it. It's dangerous to sin against the Holy Spirit. In Paul's day, the same as Noah in Jesus' day, don't go listen to the message. In Jesus' time, don't go listen to the message. In Paul's time, don't go listen to the message. And I can guarantee you that in the last day, well, let's read how Sister White puts it. Great Controversy, page 607. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put, almost, put forth almost superhuman efforts to shed away the light lest it should shine on their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. The same thing that happened in Jesus' day, in Noah's day, in Paul's day, in 1844, will happen again. Superhuman efforts to ridicule and shed away the message so nobody will hear it. But those who love the truth and want to find the truth will find it. Those that have had their hands tied, religious leaders, will go from group to group saying, we have the truth. And they will tie the people's hands so they cannot be free, binding them with cords. But some of them will break loose and join those that are free to preach the message. They look longingly in their direction. We want to be among the free, not have our hands tied. We want to be among those that are free to preach the message of the three angels. If you are scared of preaching truth, you have your hands tied if you give in to that pressure. We have to cast off, all, cast off all fear. If you are fearful of the consequences, or you might lose your job, then your hands are tied. How can, how can the commander-in-chief accept you into his special forces when you won't Obey what he says. You want to be part of the loud cry? You have to be free to follow the Lamb everywhere he takes you. So that's why today, those that are fearful, well, Revelation says the fearful will never get into heaven. If you are fearful of losing your job, fearful of what people may say, fearful of the consequences, you are eliminated from the battle. That doesn't mean that fear won't attack you now and then, because fear attacked even Jesus. But that doesn't mean you have to give in to it. It doesn't mean that you have to submit to it. In fact, 
Fear is an enemy. Fear comes from the enemy. Satan uses fear to control people. You can't go to the restaurant. You can't go to the bank. You won't be able to travel. You won't get medical care. You can't go to the public hospital. And people would stand in line even if it cost them their life. Fear. So who's, who was able to stand during those days? <laughs> Very few. Some innocently gave in because they just followed the advice of others. But those who were thinking, those who knew, they still stood in line. That's why that, the, the injection was only a test run basically to see if you will submit your conscience for the sake of comfort. Knowing that it's going to hurt your body and could kill you. But what, what's, what really surprises me is that what really surprises me is that they never forced anybody to take it. They only used threats. Nobody was actually grabbed and thrown onto the ground and injected. Everybody had to stand in line voluntarily. What? Coercion. It was a voluntary. And in Bolivia they made it very clear. Only those who volunteer will get it. But almost everybody volunteered. But, but Bolivia, I don't know if in the Philippines, but Bolivia is one of those countries that if you just want to buy the certificate, you can. It was found out that 30% of all those that were carrying a certificate around never got the shot. But in the United States, they were, it wasn't so easy. Huh? <laughs> anyway, they offered it to me right up front. Uncle David, we'll just give you the certificate. We have, we have doctors that will sign, and you'll be on the register. No, no thank you. How can I preach? How can I preach about that and myself and be a card-carrying? I can't. So, so we didn't travel, and we didn't go to the bank, and we didn't do that until they lifted that, and we could go back again. But Noah's Day, Jesus' Day, Paul's Day, Advent Movement Day, the same things, and now we can expect what will happen. The last invitation of God to his people before the door closes for the remnant will involve the same tactics. Don't go to listen. Superhuman efforts. Let's look at the ten virgins. The ten virgins represent the church. Not all Christians. It represents only those that are expecting the second advent and are waiting for the bridegroom. Adventists. All of the ten virgins were Adventists. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. There was a difference here. Some just joined the crowd holding a lamp, waiting for the bridegroom. But some said, I have to have oil in my lamp. Not just a lamp. So they made arrangements to take extra oil. While the bridegroom tarried, they all, not five, they all slumbered and slept. So even today, there are virgins waiting for the bridegroom that have been making character preparations to the Holy Spirit, but that are still sleeping. They recognize their need. They love the Lord. The Holy Spirit is telling them, correct this, correct that. And they're allowing, they're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. They don't necessarily understand how close we are, but they're wise virgins. 
but they still don't realize how close we are to the final events. So they're sleeping because the bridegroom is tearing. At midnight, when they least expected it, a cry was made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. That's the midnight cry. That's our cry that will illuminate us to the Jesus coming. Because it's, it's true of his second coming. The bridegroom is coming. How do they know that? They see all the things and they say, when you see all these things, you know that it's near even at the door. At midnight, all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And then the foolish said to the wise, give us oil for our lamps are gone out. They made no preparation. They were just trusting that there would be no delays and that every, they would squeeze in at the last minute. But the wise answered and say, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Let me put it in other words. How did you get oil, extra oil in your lamps? Oh, we went to camp meeting. We listened to videos. We studied Daniel and Revelation. Are you holding a card up? <laughs> did they ask you to? You're doing voluntarily. <laughs> and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. That is the saddest moment in Advent history. Because once they, those that were ready go in to the wedding and the door is shut, no more Seventh-day Adventists will ever be allowed in again. If you know the truth and you ignore it and don't live it and don't make arrangements to get oil on your lamp, but I won't be dogmatic about what I just said because it could be that some never really understood and God will help them to understand. And there were some that for different reasons maybe they drifted out and never thought about. They weren't violating their conscience. They weren't inside. They didn't know all the truth. They just simply were tempted to deviate from the straight and narrow path. Maybe some were thrown out Maybe some chose to leave. Maybe some just, the winds took them away. And God will give them a chance to understand their condition. Everybody must be given a chance to understand their condition before the door closes. God will not be unfair. But those who know truth, those who continually reject truth, that they will be left outside Many, many pulpits will be preaching. The Sunday law came. Let's get ready. It'll be too late to move to the country. It'll be too late to get oil on your lamp. Those that are ready will go in. The marriage takes place in heaven. The oil comes down of the anointing as Jesus is anointed king of kings. Let me, let me ask you, when little David was anointed by Samuel, was that a guarantee from God that he would be king someday? Assuming he would follow God's instructions, right? But if, if David was anointed to be king of Israel, was he in his mind certain that if he did God, what God asked him to, God would fulfill that? Yes or no? Yes. So now, he goes to visit his brothers and he sees Goliath. He wasn't scared of facing Goliath. I've been anointed to be king of Israel. How is Goliath going to cut off my head? Do you see, how, you see how an understanding of God's calling in your life protects you from fear? David went out with full confidence because he knew that Goliath could not kill him. He knew God would reward him. God was with him. So the same way, when 144,000 receive the anointing, all fear disappears. You will be able to go and face the enemy and go straight into cross the Red Sea if you have to, no problem. Because you know that God has called you to do a job. Now, again, 
There's a lot of a lot of symbols in Revelation, but I believe one of those symbols, one of those symbols that in a special way reveals a loud cry is the two witnesses. I know that I know that the, it represents the Old and New Testament in the past, but it also has a future context when the loud cry goes forth and they're going to be dressed in sackcloth and nobody can stop them for how many days? How many years? Three and a half years. And they will finish the job and nobody can touch them until the job is done. I don't exactly know what it means that their dead bodies laid in. I'm not, I'm not sure what it means that their dead bodies lay in the streets and what is, what is called what? What are, the, what are the symbols of the cities where their bodies lay? Do you remember? Sodom and Egypt. Right, those two cities. I'm not, we'll know more, but maybe somebody else is studying on that. I'd like to learn more. But they do it, they preach their message, they fulfill their mission, and nobody can stop them. That's, what's, that's what the loud cry is going to do. Nobody can stop the message. And these wise virgins go into the wedding, they receive the anointing, and when others come later, Jesus will say, I didn't know you. Oh, I don't want to hear that message. I don't want to ever hear those words, I didn't know you. You don't, you don't want to hear them. Did you know that the wicked won't even understand what is happening? Even when the, when the plagues are falling, they won't understand. But seventh, ex Seventh Avenues will understand. Once you understand that you're receiving the plagues, you understand there is no hope. The door has closed. Their probation has passed. I don't want to be an ex Seventh Day Adventist, especially when I begin to understand that I'm on the outside. The time is almost finished. It's already finished. You can hold up the other side if you want. <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> can I keep going a little longer? Is that okay? Sure. Just to finish the outline here. Until six. Until six? Thank you. That was a kind of... <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'm trying to be courteous. Um, a comfortable church in a Laodicean state will never accept the message of the loud cry. We are calling people to come out of Babylon and out of Babylon's methods. But you know what? There's another cry that we have to make now. Babylon, come out of me. We're supposed to call others out of Babylon, but Babylon has its roots in our hearts. Doesn't it? I was driving a radio, of, driving a car a few years ago, and there was a radio. I just turned it on to stay awake at night, and I heard one chord, and I turned the radio off. Ah, I told my wife, I know every word of that song. That's all it took was one chord, and pull it back from my teenage years. It's all registered there. I thank the Lord there was one song that kept rolling and rolling and rolling in my head. It wasn't a, a very good song. And ah, I thank the Lord that that song, I just forgot it and the Lord has taken it out several times it wants to come back. I said, no, no, I don't want to remember it. And I haven't. But there's other songs that I heard so many times that it's all there. I won't mention it because some of you might even know it. <laughs> that's, be, that's because Babylon has put its roots in our mind. The way we think about education, the way we think about money, the way we think about professional prestige, work, position, authority, even inside the church there's politics that make us want to do things. It, Babylon has a different way Jesus never fought for the 
for authority. Jesus never fought. He was the humblest of the humble, and he was servant of all. That's the spirit we need to have, a servant of all. I think we were flying to the Philippines. No, we were flying to Japan. And I bought, I bought a ticket for my wife and I on United Airlines. And, and we sat in economy. But when we checked in, they said, uh, since, you, since you are an invited of one of our captains, in other words, I, I got the ticket through the captain. And he said, since you have been invited by one of our captains, we would like you bump, to bump you up to first class for free. I said, for free? First class flying to the other side of the world? That means it, it's a whole bed. I mean, those, you, you know, you, when you fly from the States here, first class or business class, they can lie completely flat. And I said, well, thank you. That's a special privilege. And so we, we were there. But we, I don't think like first class. I think like economy. So those that, those that are used to first class, they may think I'm here to be served. But I'm always thinking different because I'm used to living at a different level. So, so as, a, as a stewardess was coming down the aisle, I, she broke a glass and it fell down and broke. I jumped out of my seat and started picking up all the glass pieces. No, sir, please, please, no, 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 I, I'm happy to help you, ma'am. No, but we don't want our... She got very angry at me. Like, a first class client had to get up and pick up the pieces? But that's what you would do for any lady. Well, I made her mad again. She came and brought us a beautiful meal, a big steak. That's a first-class meal on an airplane. I said, I'm sorry, we're, we don't eat meat. Do you have anything vegetarian? What? She was already angry at me. <laughs> what? This is the best meal on the airplane, and you're not going to eat it? I said, but we just got bumped up from economy, and there was no time for you to prepare ahead of time, but we don't eat this. Could you just bring us something else? She goes, imagine that. People won't eat what you give them. Now she was really mistreating a first-class passenger. <laughs> but I realized, what would Jesus have done? What I did was, before I left, I gave every one of them the book Mission Pilot. And then she looked at me and said, you're a pilot too? I said, you'll love this story. It's a love story. Don't you like love stories? You can read. Romantic, but it's not a novel. It's real. We are called to serve. And it's not easy to deal with difficulties. It's not easy to deal with opposition from a certain type of people that don't want to hear the message. I already mentioned the other day, if you're a young person that just is graduating from college or medicine or engineering or whatever, this is a really hard message for you. You mean, you mean Jesus is coming in just a few years? A few months? Yes. I won't get to practice my profession? Why, I just inherited my dad's farm. I just inherited my parents' business. I'm now the CEO. I'm just starting my life. And you're telling me I'm not going to have a life? Not on this earth. That's not a very pleasant message. One of my brothers is an evangelical. And he came home one day. He's a very kind individual. He's a Christian, but he left the Advent faith. And he came, and one day he said, our pastor in church today told us that Jesus probably will not come for 2,000 years. He said, I am so glad. I don't have to worry about Jesus is coming. You need to get ready. And I thought, only a person who's comfortable could say that. If you lived in Africa and your church was burned down and your family was kidnapped and taken into slavery or maybe you were a slave in North Sudan 
Wouldn't you want Jesus to come? What about if your family was all murdered? Wouldn't you want the resurrection to be soon? When, when you're living comfortable, a comfortable church doesn't want Jesus to come. This is not a fun message. Every, my life is going well. I want it to continue the way it is. Thank you. That's why there's no place for Laodicea in heaven. Unless you repent. Unless you buy from without money, without price. You buy ointment for your eyes. It's white raiment and gold refined by fire. I heard a sermon one time. Jesus loves Laodicea. And it's true. Of course he loves Laodicea. But the implication of the sermon was Laodicea is going to go to heaven the way it is. No, 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 no. That's wrong. He loves Laodicea. But the only solution God offers Laodicea is to buy ointment, white raiment, and gold. Otherwise, he will vomit them out of his mouth. Jesus said, whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The rich young man was looking for something, and he knew that the young master could give it to him. So he went to Jesus. Master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus knew exactly what his heart wanted and gave him the, what do you say, receta? Prescription, Prescription that's what it was. Thank you. Is that a Tagalog word? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, gave him the prescription for exactly what he needed. Joy, salvation, happiness. Go sell that which thou hast and give to the poor and come and follow me. If the young man would have said, Master, that's very hard, but will that give me what I'm looking for? Jesus would have given him more assurance. But he never asked for clarification. He just bowed his head and went away sadly. He never found what he wanted. He died, an older man, probably, with plenty of houses and lands. His kids inherited everything, and he never found salvation or happiness. The sanctuary work in the most holy place is what God is doing today to prepare his bride. And there will be great joy in heaven when the bride cooperates. Rejoice, O heavens and earth, for who got herself ready? For the bride's wife has made herself ready. Oh, that's going to be a joyful day in heaven. Did you know that's, that's the only thing that is holding back the final events? The only thing. Revelation 7 says, Hold the winds until the servants of God are sealed on their foreheads. Do we have to worry about a third world war? You can see wars and rumors of wars everywhere. But we don't have to worry about it because the angels are going to hold the winds until the job is done. But once they release those winds, the destruction of Jerusalem of old will only be a faint shadow of what's going to happen worldwide. Brother Gabriel told us there are three types of angels. And the worst type of angel is the angel that destroys. They're filled with hate. They start wars and they want to destroy, but they are chained. They're preparing. But when those angels are released, then you'll get an idea what, what hateful destruction really is. They will go forth and the human race has never been, and the forces of hell have never been allowed to be unleashed like these are going to be unleashed. Satan has total control of the finally impenitent, which means the whole entire human race that's not been sealed will be demon-possessed. I don't want to live in that world. No wonder, and at that time shall Michael stand up 
the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was ever since it was a nation even to that time. But your people shall be saved. Everyone that's found written in the book. We want to be in the book. Keep your name in the book. Where's the book? In heaven. It's not a book on earth. It's a book in heaven. One lady came to me and said, I was preaching about the health message and I got thrown out of the church. And she said, can I be saved? And I said, as long as your name is written on the book of life, you'll be saved. The book of life is not about church membership. It's about loyalty and obedience to God. There are some people in the church that are nominal and there are some people that have been thrown out that are children of God. Only God knows the difference. Don't leave the church. Stay in and do your job. But if some people don't agree and you do get thrown out, just keep your name on the book of life. There's not a human book. That's a Catholic mindset. The Catholic mindset is if you're excommunicated, you cannot be saved. That, but that's Catholic. Unfortunately, the Catholic countries in the world, many Adventists have come out of Catholicism and they still believe that. When I was teaching at the University in Caribbean Union College, it's now the University of the Southern Caribbean, one of the East Indian, you know, with roots in India, East Indian um, professors, actually the academic dean, I think he was, we were very close friends, and he, he had the reputation of, he's the only man I have ever met that was officially excommunicated from the Catholic Church. I mean, if I'd have met Martin Luther, if I would have been alive, he would have been another one. But I've never met somebody who was excommunicated, except for him. So I, I said, do you have a certificate? Do you have it on your wall? Have you put it? No, I don't know if I have it. I don't know where it is. I said, well, let me shake your hand at least. I want to shake somebody who was officially excommunicated. I don't know. Have you ever met somebody who was officially excommunicated? Not yet. It has the Pope's signature. To be excommunicated, you have to. I went into Gospel Ministries International the other day. I went into the accountant's office. He doesn't work there anymore, but he worked there for 10 years. And on his wall... He had a, a big thing and it said, it said, official indulgence. Your sins have been forgiven you. Signed by the Pope. And I said, that's very interesting what you have on the wall, but get it off the wall. I don't want that on our wall at Gospel Ministries International. Put it on your wall at your house. But it's still an interesting document. An official indulgence where your sins are forgiven as long as you pay so much money. And for the Pope to sign it, it requires a lot of money. Because it's all about money. But it was still interesting. God, Jesus is doing his final work in the most holy place and he's almost finished. His main work in cleansing a sanctuary is not a symbolic little gesture of doing something in heaven, he has a people on earth that need this sanctuary cleansed. And if we're going to cooperate with him, he needs to take out the love of the world, worldliness, and Babylon out of our brains. And the best thing is, he's going to eventually not only write pardoned beside our sins, he's going to eventually blot them out and there will be no more record of it. Nobody will find it. And now, I think I understand when Sister White said, they will try to recall their sins and they won't be able to recall them. I thought, that's ridiculous. You mean if, if I kill somebody, I won't remember that I killed them? I was preaching at Mountain View College. And there was a, a young man standing outside who was also going to speak. And he said, Pastor David, I'm not sure if God can save me. Why? Because 
I have sinned so much against God. I'm, I'm an ex-Muslim guerrilla. Gorilla. I've killed hundreds of soldiers. And then I was captured. And then they made a deal with me. If you go back to your team and kill all of them, you will be free. I went back and I killed all of my fellow team members. Not only was I a traitor to my people, I was a traitor to God. How can God ever forgive me? And I said, let me read you something. And I read him, I read him the part in the Great Controversy at the very end where it says, as the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, Jesus sits on his throne. Nearest to the throne are those that used to be most fervid workers for Satan. Gabriel. He's going to be near the throne. That gentleman's going to be near the throne. Not me, because all my life I've worked for God. I'm a sinner, but as far as I know, I haven't ever been enlisted into Satan's full-time service. I've always worked for God full time. I have sins and I've been forgiven. But these gentlemen used to work for Satan. They're killers and murderers. And God has rescued them as a brand from the burning. And God has them standing right near his throne. Who is next? Those that have perfected their characters during extreme persecution and in time of difficulty and trouble. Perfected characters come next. In other words, during difficult times are those people that have allowed God to so control them that even though you're tempted from all sides, you have allowed God total control. And you've received the seal. The 144,000. And who comes next? The martyrs. All of those that gave their lives for their sake. And who's beyond them? The great multitude. And they all surround the throne and sing hallelujah to the Lamb. I just want to be there. But if God can allow me to be part of those that, if he can perfect my character, and I know he can, if I will ask him and cooperate with him, then I know that he can do it and I can be there. We must strive to be among them. We must not, we must not just float into heaven because we may not get there floating. There's a, common, there's a concept going around in many Adventist circles that we're going to keep sinning until Jesus comes. That's a lie from Satan. Those who are sinning when Jesus comes are, have just received the last plagues. If you're alive when Jesus comes, you either were resurrected in a special resurrection or you lived through the time of trouble and lived without sin during a time when there was no intercessor. Those are the only two groups. And then everybody else will be resurrected. Finally, I want to end with mathematics. I love math. I'm not a genius in math. I did, I did have a genius working for me when I was the director of computer services. He could multiply five digits by five digits. Tell him, 5,000, no, 52,123 times 78,344. Plop, he'd give you the answer. I, I can type it in on my calculator, and I can do the long math, but he would do it in his head. He was such a genius that one time we were installing some Microsoft software on 30 computers in the computer lab. So I said, install this Microsoft Office. Chink, serial number, uh, code. Okay, next one. Pull out another one, install it. He stopped halfway. He said, David, I figured it out. What did you figure out? I don't need a serial number anymore. I just figured out their code. And he installed all the rest of them without even looking at a piece of paper. That's a genius, right? 
X, Y, one, two, three, dash, dum, dum, that, dash, dum, dum. How in the world do you make sense of all those? He figured it out. Anyway, he's a genius. I'm not a genius. But I like, do you know what fuzzy logic is? When you, ladies, when you put your clothes in a washing machine and you push start, the new washing machines do this. And then the water starts filling up. You know what it was doing? It was trying to figure out how much clothes you had in there. By turning it like this, if it's full, it takes more energy to move it. And if it just moves easy, maybe you only have a t-shirt in there. And if it's hard, it takes more energy. And then it says, this is a full load. I'm going to fill it up with water all the way to the top. But if, it, if it's easy to move, it says, this is a very light load. I'm only going to put water to one-fourth of the way. That's called fuzzy logic. It doesn't know, there's no, there's no beam of light that measures it, but it just calculates that that's how much clothes you have because of the amount of current it takes to move it. Well, you can do fuzzy math. I used to tell my children, children, how tall is that building over there? And my kids would say, well, Daddy, how do we know? We're not there to measure it. No, just give me an estimate. Use fuzzy math. Like, what? Well, count how many stories? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And what is an average height of a, of a floor, of a story? Eight to ten feet? Okay, so tell me it's somewhere between 80 and 100 feet. Good, that's called fuzzy math. Well, I did some fuzzy math, and Satan is much better at math and I am. And that's why Brother Gabriel was saying the main strategy of satanic angels is to get as many people to be lost as possible so they don't have to pay for their sins. So they're playing defense. Deceive the world, cause them to be lost, and then you don't have to pay for their sins. And that's what they were told. The angels have to pay for their own sins, plus the sins of those that they caused to, be, to sin, and they're saved. Well, I just did a little fuzzy math. Who's going to, if you read the Great Controversy, who's the last one to be destroyed? When everybody else is destroyed, what happens to him? He suffers on. Finally, sin and sinners, root and branch, are destroyed. Of course, the Bible doesn't say how long he's going to be there, but there's a couple of little things that give me an idea why he's so scared and why he suffers so much during a thousand years. From Ellen G. White's writings, from the Spirit of Prophecy, the shortest amount that anybody will suffer in hell is how long? A second. Some are destroyed as in a second. Some will never even be resurrected because maybe they never even had a brain or they were, die they were born or, may you know, whatever. They, they didn't have any sins. But some people will be destroyed as in a second. So the shortest amount that anybody can suffer is one second. As far as we know, right, it's fuzzy. That Sister White wasn't trying to say, get your stopwatch and check one second. She wasn't trying to communicate that. But just poof, it's done. The hardest thing about hell is not, it's not being destroyed. It's the fact that you lost eternal life. When you see what the inheritance is and you lost it because of your choices, that is the worst punishment that could ever happen. Eternal, eternal death is a horrible thing in comparison to eternal life. Well, I ask myself, I wonder how many people are going to be saved? One hundred forty-four thousand, at least, right? But they're the first roots. And then you have martyrs, and there's 30 million martyrs. 
that died just in the Middle Ages, not to count the martyrs before, and not to count the martyrs later. So we're talking 30 million, 144,000 that we know. What about the great multitude that weren't martyrs? Are they more than the martyrs or less than the martyrs? If you see a great multitude, is it usually large or is it small? Great multitude without number. No man could number, right? Or 10,000 times 10,000. Does that give you an idea? That's the biggest number in Hebrew. 10,000 times 10,000. So you say 10 times 10. A hundred million. A hundred million plus thirty million plus a hundred and forty four thousand. A hundred yeah, a hundred and thirty million one hundred and forty four thousand. That's that's only what we know. I mean that's that's just an estimate. It's fuzzy math, right? I'm gonna store it here. And I'm going to divide it by 3,600, which will give me hours. Then I'm going to divide it by 24. Gives me days. I'm going to divide it by 365. Four years. That's fuzzy math. And the way God works has not even related to the way we think. We can't even know what God thinks. But you know what? No wonder Satan looks forward with trembling and terror to the consequences of his great rebellion during a thousand years. You wouldn't want to be punished for four years, but then compared to an eternal burning hell that they preach in evangelical churches, Satan deserves what he gets, and somebody who only lived 20 years who was a gang member is going to suffer for eternity? The way they described it in the 1800s, a little bird grabs a feather and he flies from the moon to the earth. It takes him forever to get there because it's slow. Finally he gets to earth and the earth is a big steel ball. And as he flies by, the feather touches the steel ball, then he flies back to the moon and comes back and touches the earth with the feather again. And when the steel ball is worn away by the feather, Eternity has just begun. Can you imagine a God torturing somebody that long? That's horrible to think about. How can you live only 21 years and suffer eternally? No. A God of love is also a just God. So even with my stupid, fuzzy math, I still believe even if a just God gives exactly what somebody deserves, missing eternal life has to be the worst thing that ever happened to anybody. Is there a price? Do you have a price? Satan will try to buy you. I was really, really, really poor when I got married. We worked hard. Turn it around. <laughs> I got to finish. I was really, really poor. And we worked as nurses every weekend, Saturday night, Sunday morning, 24 hours in, in, in 24 hours. I worked two shifts, she worked one, back to school. I taught aviation. And we, at the end of the month, we had $5 every month, $5. That was our disposable income. The rest of it went to absolute necessities. So when I needed to buy an alternator for my car, I couldn't even buy it, so I didn't buy an alternator for about six months. I didn't have enough money to buy an alternator. So I just charged the battery in the wall, drove it around, and charged it at nighttime because I had no alternator. And then I finished my training. I finished aviation maintenance. I was ready to be a mission pilot nurse and to fly overseas. And then... The pharmacist at our Adventist hospital said, David, I want you to be on, my, on the board of our pharmaceutical association. I said, but I'm leaving for the mission field. Oh, don't leave yet. 
I'm going to pay you $50,000 a year just to be on the board. That's about, that's, a, like, that's over 100 today. Compared to the minimum wage, that would be like $150,000. And then, just to be on the board. Not even working every day. And then, the, the guy that owned the, 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 the coal company had a nice, very expensive airplane. And he said, David, I want you to fly for me. He said, I'm a sinner. I run around with girls all the time. I drink alcohol. I'm going to hell. But as long as you're flying for me, I won't go to hell yet. Because I know God will protect you. Well, uh, I'll pay you $50,000 a year. 50 there and 50 there. I was tempted to say, maybe we should not go to the mission field quite yet. Let's work for a year. But one year would have turned into two years, two years to three years, and they would have offered me more money. The question is, does David Gates have a price? And one day I realized, this, Satan, he's trying to buy me. Why didn't I get money before when I needed it? Now that I'm going to the mission field, now he offers me money. He just wants to keep me out of God's work. No. He raised it from a 50 to 100,000. No. I said, even if you offer me a million, the answer is no. I work for God. Nobody, there's no price you can buy me. And I'd like to suggest that any one of you that is called by God to do a work, God will allow Satan to throw meat in front of you to see if you bite it. But there's a fish hook inside. What's your price? Name your price. Sunday law? Serve Satan? Money? Power? Fame? What is it? Name your price. Satan will pay it. Don't accept any price. It's not worth it. Live a life of liberty, following the Lamb everywhere he goes, even if you're poor. Great joy. You're the ambassador of the Most High. Honor God in your life and your decisions. Never, never be bought off for any price. Serve the Master. He gave everything for us. And He deserves our loyalty. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've discussed a lot of interesting concepts and ideas. But the one thing that sticks in our mind is that we owe our loyalty to you. You gave everything for us. You even risked eternal separation from your Father. For us, we want to give you everything we are. Everything we have, we lay in your hands. Dear Lord, take us, prepare us, protect us from the enemy. May we never have a price. No matter what it is, we will follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we thank you, Lord, for this weekend that has, this week that has encouraged us so much, the testimonies, the sermons, the presentations. As we separate tomorrow, guard us and keep us. May your face shine upon us and give us peace. Amen.